I apologise for the late start of Grand Rounds. We had a distinguished invited speaker who's just shuffling his way to the back of the auditorium. Um, so we afforded him the opportunity to finish his presentation. Uh, he's welcome to stay. Not so much. So, um, I would normally start with parish notices, but I'm not going to because we're already 14 minutes behind time. Um, so I will just introduce our two speakers today. Nicholas Gembry has returned after giving a talk in the last semester. She wants to have another crack at it. And she's going to talk about MDT working in non-malignant disease. And then Magda Chefchik. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> It's terrible. I really should be able to pronounce your name. Um, <laughs> he's going to talk about clinical effectiveness and how the radiology department are working to improve uh, their interactions with the rest of the hospital. Is that right? Excellent. So I shall introduce Nicola. I'm afraid she's a bit upset at the moment. Uh, and you'll have seen in the, in the news that a world-famous monument on Gozo, which is the small island next to Malta, has collapsed. So um, I'm afraid she's still a little bit bereft about that. But hopefully we can cheer her up. And hopefully she can get through this presentation in time to let her poor husband get away uh, to Australia, um, where he's going to a conference. So, so he tells me I have to get you to speed I up. To. Yes, okay. I will, so, I will, I will. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, so hi, everyone. Um, so we just wanted to give uh, a different slant to what everybody's opinion of radiology department is all about. And it's not just about reporting. So what I wanted to introduce today is a concept of the role of MDTs in the context of benign disease. I'm sure we're all um, inundated with participation in cancer-related MDTs. We do have lots of clinical radiological meetings that we hold within the department and externally to discuss um, you know, and kind of act as troubleshooters, but sometimes it's more of an educational a meeting, but MDT in the concept as the name actually stands for could actually change and impact um, benign disease that might not be given as much importance as perhaps um, uh, malignancy. So elephants and maggots, we'll get to that soon. So this is quite a common situation that I, I face. So we're giving clinical details as helpful as this by Dr. X with a bleep that clearly is not contactable during daytime. And then the report we issue is abnormal lungs. So I'm not sure that report is helpful either way. So let's have a look and see um, what, uh, what we can do. So it's very much, it's an MDT. I'm using uh, the interstitial lung disease MDT as an example because um, interstitial lung diseases are a chronic condition which are very debilitating, um, particularly the idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, um, which is a difficult condition to manage um, if we don't put lots of things into context. So when we face CTs like that and we face the patient as well, do we love these conditions? Do we hate them? It's, it's a difficult one. But hopefully, the more we understand them, we'll hopefully start to love them a bit more, um, the way I do. So three pivotal parameters that we need um, for, to make the diagnostic process a bit more efficient is we need to take the clinical context um, into consideration so clinicians will give us more information from the patient's symptoms and primary function test. But the more important factor that's coming into play to give us an idea what's actually going on is the temporal change of the disease, both from imaging perspective and also from the clinical perspective, how it's behaving and how the patient is behaving based on external exposure to in the environment, but also any treatment that we give them. Now, the radiological findings are not really, um, it's not, we're not really looking into a pattern mnemonic pattern anymore, really. We're looking into what is the pattern of disease as such, is distribution and any ancillary findings that we can see in addition to the abnormality we see that can give us some more information as to what we think might be going on. So back in the day where we used to um, go and think, oh, what's the diagnosis in this patient um, when we look at these abnormal lungs, or oh, just go to pathology, they'll give us an answer. We now know that maybe pathology might not necessarily be the gold standard, and the pathologists themselves are finding themselves in a situation very much like we are in imaging, where we think that maybe we think this looks like something, but actually when we speak to the clinician, they're telling us, oh, it's not behaving like that at all. So perhaps there isn't one gold standard, and maybe it might be a matter of 
looking into things um, together from different angles. So I just brought up uh, the, the definition of MDT here, and we all know what the MDT is, a multidisciplinary team. Uh, it's a group of health workers. We all come together from our different backgrounds and hopefully coordinate um, our uh, um, knowledge to, to, to kind of manage the, the patient in a more coherent way. But it could also mean mountain daytime uh, time and, and also maggot debridement therapy. So that's where maggots come in. And this is where the elephant comes in. So we can see things very differently if we're standalone, you know, if we're blinded um, to what's going on, we might completely um, miss the woods for the tree. So um, who are the MDT members in the ILD MDT that uh, we've set up um, a few years back? So you clearly need a clinician, um, usually the respiratory physician, many of which would have an ILD um, interest. Ideally, there's an ILD specialist nurse here in Tayside. We don't have that facility, unfortunately. There is one ILD nurse across all Scotland based in the West Coast, um, and she is extremely useful um, to, to the team there. So it would be really nice if we do have funding to support the patients. But the clinicians can give us, besides seeing the behavior and nature of the pulmonary function test, they give us an idea of how the patient is behaving. There's a radiologist um, to give the, the, the appearances of the uh, imaging. We use chest x-rays quite a lot because they give us a good idea of the temporal change with time. And it's, it's very much a situation sometimes where the patient might have just the one HRCT, which could be quite difficult um, to interpret if we don't have that time factor. And they, so the chest x-rays really support that. Um, a chest pathologist is really useful as part of the ILDMDT. So Prof Carey is the, um, is a, is the pathologist um, here at Tayside who to comes to represent the pathology department. In an ideal setting, we'll have the thoracic surgeons as well, but that would be really pushing it. So I've really tried my best to get this ILDMDT set up, let alone getting the surgeons as well, but, but we're laying for that. So they'll give us an idea from their support as well with regards to tissue sampling. Um, and then the pathologist can interpret that. So what's the role of the HRCT? It's really not just to give a description of, of the image, really. It's we kind of, we have to take all these factors in mind as to the, the and gender and age of the patient, because depending, that could really determine what kind of disease entity we're talking about. So we know, for example, that idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is really not a disease of the young female patient. So if we see that um, kind of category of patients, we really need to um, revisit our diagnosis. Exposure um, to drugs and, and dusts in particular, smoking in particular, and any history of connective tissue disease obviously will, will give us um, some information. The temporal change affects a lot, and you will come to that um, when I'll, I'll, I'll proceed further throughout um, the uh, slides. Presence of other coexistent disease. So idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis tends to go quite hand in hand with emphysema. So it seems like um, smoking um, is very relevant to the etiology of both. But we'll talk about the role of the HRCT in the actual prognostication of these conditions. Now, this is just a reminder of what patterns we see, and I am not going to be teaching you what ILD patterns look like on CT. This is not the scope of this um, chat at all. But just to remind you, there's quite a distinctive feature between what we used to call before, you know, cryptogenic pulmonary fibrosis, which we're calling now um, IPF. It's very much a pattern we describe on imaging. We cannot tell you that the patient has idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. We can only show you that there is a pattern which shows predominant basal involvement. There's presence of reticulation with traction, bronchodilatation, and honeycombing as compared with other fibrotic conditions where maybe the distribution is different and you might have more upper zone involvement, you might have areas of ground glass opacification which you don't actually expect to see much in the other conditions. And um, perhaps the distribution could be different and the extent could be different. So this is just a bit of a, a refresher of what things could look like. Now, this is a graph that can show you how um, the prognosis is between different types of fibrotic diseases. So in the one I showed you here on the left-hand side, the prognosis is significantly worse um, as compared with conditions similar to this. So you can see from this chart how these patients do far better, which is the non-specific the non interstitial pneumonitis, 
as compared with the usual interstitial pneumonias. Now remember, at the start, I was talking about benign disease, and we always talk about cancer as being, oh, you know, we need to deal with cancer really quickly because patients are going to die. But these patients, as you can see, die by five, four or five years since diagnosis. So we really need to give a stronger consideration as to whether we can do something about this or not. Now, the role of the MDT um, has been talked about because we could actually make an influence on the outcome of these patients. So whereas before we used to rely on pathology as the gold standard telling us, oh, this is um, a UIP pattern, they're seeing you know, established fibrosis, then you've kind of put a, a label to the patient as though, oh, actually, this is um, end-stage disease, we can do nothing about it. But actually, when you get people together, it's been found um, through studies that when biopsy and the HRCT pattern both agree that this looks like a pattern like I showed you on the left-hand side of use interstitial pneumonitis, then we can actually make a, a definite diagnosis that yes, this is likely what the disease condition is and yes, the patient unfortunately is going to have a higher mortality. But when there's a discrepancy between the biopsy findings and the HRCT findings, so we think, oh, actually, the HRCT is not quite supporting what the pathologist is seeing. Overall, the patient does actually have a better outcome. And then yet again, if we both think that none of these patterns actually fit in with what we think is the definite pattern of UIP, then the patient has a significantly better outcome. So the studies have actually shown that when we all get together, we have actually changed the diagnosis. So that's why now we're wanting to steer more towards an MDT diagnosis of these ILDs, and particularly idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So why does it matter, actually? Um, well, it really matters as to whether we're going to do anything about it or not, because, you know, in the day and age, it was that if you do have idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, that's it. We can't really do anything about it, and unfortunately, you're going to die. But actually, we, we have found that maybe we can um, improve. Um, so what we're doing here is really integrating all the information we've got as to whether the disease is extensive, what type of pattern, whether it is the more UIP type of pattern versus the better looking NSIP. Um, with the temporal change, is it progressing really fast or is it very slow? If it is progressing fast, then the chances are it might actually be idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis because we know that that actually is quite rabid and the decline, as you saw, is really quick within the first four years. And if there are any other causes, we know that the idiopathic type actually has a far worse prognosis than if we know there was an etiological factor such as connective tissue disorders or an inhalational drug or, or dust that maybe we can remove. So the HRCT is really good at telling us the pattern. Is the pattern going to be one of those of the bad ones or the good one? Is the extent, is there a lot of disease? Because yes, you know, it's kind of understandable. If there's a lot of disease, then the chances are actually you're pretty unwell with it, if at all. Um, but also, is there an element of reversibility? So the presence of um, factors such as honeycombing and traction bronchodilatation is actually a worse prognosis in whatever condition you have. So although earlier I said that, um, you know, if the diagnosis is not idiopathic and we think it is related to an underlying condition, for example, rheumatoid arthritis, we know that rheumatoid arthritis is a very direct link with um, testicial lung, lung disease, but there are several patterns of diseases that we see in rheumatoid arthritis, but we know actually that the pattern that does have a definite UIP pattern actually does have a worse prognosis overall anyway. The idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis still has a far worse prognosis than the rheumatoid arthritis related. But you can see that even in their case, there might be a degree of reversibility, and they do far better. This is the way we kind of talk about extent. It's a bit of a, a rough idea, so it's very difficult to actually be um, dogmatic as to how much is actually involved. But it does have a correlation with the um, FVC of the patient, um, and they do actually have a worse outcome if it is quite extensive. So this is what the pathologist would see. So presence of traction bronchial dilatation is actually a very strong prognosticator into a worse outcome. And it has been shown that the presence of ground glass, if there's a lot of ground glass um, opacification, the patients did actually respond to treatment better. So there is probably an underlying reversible element and might not just be completely um, or, or lost. So is there a hope for the irreversible disease? Because you kind of were saying, oh, let's look for some reversibility. But 
probably there is some hope here. And um, for those who aren't from the respiratory department, hopefully this might be something new. Um, and there is the emergence of antifibrotic therapy there that has been shown to slow down the progression of the fibrotic element in these patients. So these are, these are just excerpts from um, graphs from studies that have um, had been carried out. So this was the very one of the first studies that was carried out in Japan. So it was a, a, a one country involved. But then subsequent to that, there were um, uh, there's another two studies here in between, which was a capacity um, study, and then the last one was the ascent study, which were multinational studies, which showed that once you give treatment, in this particular case, is a drug called perfenadone. There's another drug now in the market that's competing with it. The outcome is better, and you can see that the degree of um, progression of the condition actually slows down once treatment um, is, co um, is commenced. Um, so is there really a gold standard? So probably which one of these is going to take over? But actually, we all just really need to be together, um, and that's the idea behind the MDT diagnosis. So, so that's really me. I did have to whiz it, I'm afraid. Um, but I just wanted to kind of show that um, there is actually a scope for the MDT role in benign conditions, and we can actually make a change um, to patients by giving them a, hopefully a better outcome. Thank you very much. Do you want questions at the end? Or? <coughs> if you ask the questions at the end, then okay. Stuart will yeah. have gone, so then he will ask you a mean question. See you later, Stuart. You. Enjoy Australia. So... We'll go straight on to Magda then, if I can make the computer work. And then we'll have a sort of panel discussion at the end. You can come up and take questions together. Great. So, on we go. Thank you. So good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Magda Bied. I'm a clinical radiologist and uh, T-site radiology lead for clinical audit and uh, quality improvement. Um, I didn't expect Nicola to go so quickly. I thought I would have my far less time than that, but now I've got full half an hour to uh, enjoy this presentation. Um, so I uh, am going to take this time um, to talk about um, the work we have been doing in radiology to improve the imaging uh, services uh, for the hospital, I thought that the ground round is a great uh, forum to share uh, that and to uh, encourage you all to participate. Um, because the main main uh, aim I've got today is to invite you all, um, all of you from all hospital specialties, to participate and initiate um, the um, uh, joint projects with radiology uh, in the field of quality improvement, and also to encourage you to join us on the, our regular quarterly uh, quality improvement meetings we held in radiology and share your ideas, share your work and work together with us to find out how we can improve uh, what we are doing and our uh, mutual relationship. Uh, so why am I here? Why is it radiology? Uh, the one to talk to you. Um, I think we are very fortunate in radiology to be placed to, to interact with all of you on a daily basis because um, almost every patient uh, during the in or outpatient journey throughout the hospital needs imaging at some stage. Um, therefore, we um, interlink with you, uh, talk to you, and uh, work with you um, every day, and therefore we are perfectly placed to uh, be involved in many uh, cross-specialty uh, activities. And nobody works in isolation, um, and we all work towards the, the common uh, outcome for a, a safer uh, patient. Um, so I wanted to start off with... Uh, lengthy slide <laughs> that, uh, that aim is to um, remind you a little bit a concept of clinical audit and cl quality uh, improvement. I promise it's only one slide. Um, so you all will be aware that traditional audit concept has been reviewed following a Cochrane review uh, that shown that the traditional audit um, has uh, results have uh, a very small, uh, at the most, the moderate effect to the change in clinical practice. So the clinical audit has been redefined and has been taken under the umbrella of clinical effectiveness, and the shift has been made uh, from the initial stages of the audit um, 
where people were concentrating on lengthy data collection to a later stages of the audit when the emphasis is put on to um, identifying the problem and finding solutions to, to, um, to sort them out. Um, and the new concept of audit, instead of one big circle, uh, is reflected as one as a series of small circles, as you can see here, um, that done uh, sequentially, one after another, lead to significant improvement. And this is much more applicable for clinical setting, where all the problems are often multifactorial. So you have to identify all the problems and then try to work. Um, and improve every single one of them um, to, to achieve a, a better outcome. Um, currently, there is a, a need, uh, there is a recognized need uh, by trust and by organizations to have a dedicated quality improvement lead in each department uh, to deal with and to coordinate all this. And if your department does not have one, then it is a good time to think about it. Uh, so what I'm going to do over the next 10 minutes or so uh, is to talk you through a few interesting projects we have been doing or are still doing within radiology, either in conjunction with other specialties or um, that are relevant to other specialties. Uh, that, uh, and this is mainly to show you how it can be done and uh, to uh, encourage you to think about the and identify the, the problems you might have in your department when you interact with other specialties, not only with radiology, and, and think beyond the box, so think how we can do something together to, to improve what we are doing. So a very interesting uh, uh, project we have done in conjunction with Medicine of Elderly and uh, Demand Optimization Team uh, was about head CT uh, uh, requesting in acute confusion and falls. Uh, effectively, we have noticed that there is an increased uh, number of requests for CT scans coming to our department, and over a uh, year of 2015, we, can scan, we scanned nearly 8,000 heads, a um, significant proportion of which, 24%, were inpatient requests for elderly patients with falls and confusion. So we thought that maybe we should pr produce a local uh, protocol or some sort of guidelines for uh, clinicians to identify the group of patients that will benefit most from the uh, city head. Unfortunately, there is no national guidelines or no formal um, high-level evidence uh, to to uh, support ourselves with. So uh, what we have became aware of was a um, paper published by our local researchers led by um, uh, Dr. Witham in a uh, British Journal of Radiology in 2011 um, that has published a risk scoring system uh, to help uh, to select the patients um, for city head in this um, uh, situation. Uh, however, that was a small sample that needs validation, needed validation, so invi we invited Miles to help us out, and with the help of the demand optimization team, we have managed to secure um, a, a workforce to look through a sample of 200 patients uh, who came with uh, acute confusion of fall, our fall, um, and were scanned as in patients, and we've looked at the presence of the risk factors and the outcome of the CT scan to try to uh, validate the score. So this is the score uh, that was published. Uh, it takes uh, uh, things into account like uh, um, uh, presence of neurology, GCS level, uh, use of anticoagulants, giving uh, a score. I think the, m m the, the maximum you can get, get is uh, seven. And uh, the cutoff is three, so everything below three does not need scan, and everything over three needs scan. That was the assumption. The initial sample had quite good uh, negative predictive value, which is quite promising, with a sensible, uh, reasonable sensitivity specificity. Um, so we have validated, we have tried to validate that. Um, interesting results. Um, over 80% of patients had absolutely normal CT scan. Uh, from the remaining less than 20, there was a selection of stroke bleeds and space occupying lesions. When we tried to apply the score to, the, to each group um, on the bigger sample, the negative predictive value came up at 85. It's not bad, but um, we thought it's not enough to immediately uh, introduce this um, as a local protocol to our hospital and um, we thought there is further work needed to, um, to work on this but um, 
uh, it was a, a very useful exercise and um, just showing how difficult it is sometimes to actually draw a local protocol. So at the moment we are still scanning everybody, but <laughs> there is a hope somewhere uh, there. Out, okay. Um, so another interesting project about renal protection, very common problem prior to inpatient contrast enhanced CT. Uh, that uh, we've decided to look at uh, how well are you guys in declaring the renal function on the request uh, for CT scan, uh, how well you administer the renal protection once it's identified that it's needed and what is the actual incidence of post-contrast enhanced CT acute kidney injury in our unit. Um, there were two audit cycles in each we've uh, looked at 13 patient CT sessions prospectively. In the second cycle we've looked at the total of 358 requests and we've identified 47 patients with EGFR less than 45, uh, which was about 13%. So when we looked at the declaration of renal function prior to CT on the request, in the first cycle it was 81%. We thought it's not quite uh, there yet, so what we've decided to do is to help you out by creating a link on eyes that helps you to automatically fill the EGFR level um, that is most up to date, and you will be familiar with that screen. That's that's all <laughs> our fault, uh, and you can bring up automatically the EGFR, so it does not require up, uh, looking up it somewhere else, and that obviously caused a significant improvement because it became much easier in the busy environment, uh, with 93% of all the uh, requests having uh, declared uh, appropriate up-to-date renal function. In terms of administration of renal protection, according to local guidelines, um, we have identified the problem in the first cycle that there was no formal way to document your decision about the need for a renal protection on the request. Therefore, this documentation didn't exist really. So what we've uh, decided is to use ICE again and to um, to link the um, ICE request to the local guideline on renal protection so you can just press the button and look it up and we've created special questions on ICE that kind of prompt you to make a decision prior to the scan whether this particular patient requires um, renal protection or not. Um, in the second cycle, that um, brought a, a significant improvement with nearly 98% of patients uh, with EGFR less than 45, which is the cutoff for consideration of renal protection, had a, a documented decision regarding the need for renal protection on the ICE request, which helps us enormously. In terms of incidence of acute kidney injury, what is quite interesting is that from these 47 patients that had uh, abnormal EGFR of less than 45 and you thought they need renal protection, 15% uh, never received it. Uh, uh, oh no, sorry, 27% never received it, so 13 patients, and out of which 15% 15 develop, 15 developed acute kidney injury, so that's quite a big number uh, when you compare it with the group that did receive renal protection, which was the remaining 34 of 47, and they only developed uh, acute kidney injury in 3%, so it was one case. Um, what we also identified is that the renal function check within the 48 to 72 hours post um, CT um, that is a part of the protocol for renal protection was only performed uh, in 68% of the cases, so this is something to um, take home and to improve on. Next interesting uh, work that, uh, is, uh, that has recently been uh, finished and has not been any, anywhere um, uh, presented yet, this is the first time, is uh, inpatient CT non-attenders audit. So we were uh, aware that um, there is loads of waste in inpatient CT uh, because there is a lot of unused uh, inpatient CT appointments due to late cancellations and non-attendance of patients. So we decided to assess possible causes and hopefully propose some solutions to minimize the waste because you all want scans quickly, we want to be efficient, we don't want to, uh, we can't afford any waste here. So we had a very enthusiastic student with us doing this. So he has um, audited it prospectively over 10 working days. 
Um, and during that 10 working days, we had 17 unused uh, appointments. Each appointment consists of 20 minutes, so the total waste was uh, almost equaling to six hours. Um, if you uh, count it uh, into pounds, uh, as we do this time, <laughs> this, <laughs> this um, um, very often now with uh, looking at cost effectiveness, uh, we have wasted 2,550 pounds uh, over 10 days. And if you interpolate it over a year, it's an estimated loss of 66K, which is a huge number, probably an overestimate, but it just gives you an idea of a problem. So we've looked at the reasons which were prospectively recorded by our uh, radiographers uh, when the patient did not attend and we did not manage to fill the slot, so we didn't count those that were cancelled and we've managed to fill it in. And as you can see, the good proportion of them were because the patient got transferred to another ward. So the situation when the porter goes 15 minutes before the scan to pick the patient A from ward B and the patient is no longer there and there is not enough time for the, for the porter to bring the patient uh, from somewhere else. Um, we have some measures uh, to prevent that. We always phone the ward the day before plant CT to make sure is the patient there, yes, do you know, yes. Uh, and then just immediately before we send the porter for the patient, we check the uh, electronic system. But despite these measures, this is the most common problem. Late cancellation, so your clinical decision that the scan is no longer required, but nobody actually informed radiology on time, was quite common. A double booking uh, that uh, the patient has CT and echo or endoscopy or uh, whatever else at exactly the same time uh, was quite a common problem. Uh, sometimes there is a problem with the uh, lack of uh, available porters, although it's less of a problem now since we've got our own porters in inpatient CT that this is all they are doing. And then occasionally there are factors that maybe we cannot influence, like patients refused at the last minute, um, and sometimes patient gets discharged and actually um, we are not told that now you want this scan as an outpatient. So clearly there is a lack of communication between the wards and radiology, um, which we have to address. Uh, we are planning to present the results on the next clinical cl effectiveness meeting within radiology and invite um, people from the main referring wards, such as acute medicine and surgery, to work with us to see how we can improve things even further. Um, this is uh, another project that we've done with a, a gynae department, uh, quite a successful one. Um, we've done it with the help of the month optimization team. Uh, we've looked at the appropriateness of the referrals for pelvic ultrasound from general practice uh, because we've noticed there is a, an increase, a significant increase in the number of referrals. Um, so we've reviewed a one week worth of work, 77 cases were scanned, uh, we've looked at the scan indication, details of clinical information, appropriateness of the request was assessed by radiology and gynecology consultant and the outcome of the scan and the follow up. Uh, and this was a very positive result because we've um, found out that radiology is actually quite helpful uh, because uh, we have managed to um, empower GPs to manage these patients independently without referring to secondary care because uh, of all the positive results, 57% had no further gynecology input despite the positive finding. Almost 80% were normal results, so huge reassurance for the patients. And we've managed to see patients very quickly, much more so than um, the outpatient uh, gynae clinic can manage to see them, which is often over 12 weeks. And we've also identified a, quite a poor uh, clinical information um, on referrals uh, that uh, we need to uh, uh, encourage GPs to provide more information to get more from the examination. Um, but this is another example. We've uh, looked at the follow-up imaging post-cancer uh, treatment. This can be really done for every single disease that requires a regular imaging follow-up you can think of. Uh, this is uh, one we've done with urology department on um, a group of patients post-radical cystectomy because there was a field that we 
scandem randomly and with random <laughs> uh, modality and there is really no pattern to it. So we've looked at um, three years worth of data because the stectomies are not very common, 41 patients in total. And uh, we've discovered there's as we expected, no follow-up surveillance pattern or protocol, and there is a totally random frequency of imaging and no consistent modality of imaging. So we are now working with urology um, to to uh, write up a local protocol to decide how often and which, with which modality and for how long we are going to scan these patients. There is uh, there are some guidelines, uh, nice guidelines we are planning to base it on. Um, this is a work we have done uh, as a part of a national audit led by Royal College of Radiologists. Uh, this is uh, to look at the accuracy of the CT interpretation in acute abdomen uh, in uh, out of our setting and uh, we've assessed the minor and uh, major discrepancy rate between the radiology report and the final um, diagnosis both for both surgical and non-surgical patients so either findings from laparotomy or um, a final diagnosis on discharge. And there are some standards that were set up nationally for this um, that we, we've compared our local results to. So we've looked at, sorry, it's a bit of an overlap. We have looked at 25 non-surgical and 25 surgical cases initially, and we have found one minor and one major discrepancy within a non-surgical group, which is below the national standard because it is at 4%. In surgical group, we found three minor and two major discrepancies, which is a little bit above the national standard but it's still not too bad. Um, the new kit on the block and the new um, project that uh, we are currently working on is um, referrals for CTPA and CTPA scans in the suspicion of uh, pulmonary embolies uh, that we got, um, I think it's a student involved, yeah? and one of our chest uh, radiologists um, that uh, we are going to look at the uh, local practice, again based on Royal College of Radiology's template, um, assess how appropriately we refer the patients for CTPA and also look at the percentage of detected uh, positive emboli and detected alternative diagnosis in scanned cases when compared to the gold standards uh, and published literature. The, the thing is, we are scanning more and more patients for query PE, and we've got more and more negative scans. We just want to make sure we are in a range and we are not using our services inappropriately. Uh, we don't have results for that yet, um, but hopefully they will be ready soon. Um, so that's the project. Um, I uh, have... Uh, uh, something else here I wanted to advertise. This is a Royal College of Radiologists website that has a page dedicated to audit and the, it has a lot of, clean, uh, of a very good templates and uh, ready recipes for you to use. If you think about the qual improvement process, a quality improvement project, you can go there and search. They give you a template uh, um, that you can base uh, your uh, work on so you don't have to create everything from scratch. There will be standards, there will be, there will be reference there that you can, you can use. And that's all. Thank you very much. Right, so. I think that's great. All that, you know, I think, um, I think back 10, 15 years to when I was a very junior doctor and we were all asked to do a clinical audit and it was a, we had to go and collect 200 sets of notes from some dusty old room somewhere and trawl through 200 sets of notes and, uh, and at the end of it you'd run out of time and then you'd never do it. This change to, to doing quality improvement projects, I know that the trainees will look at the sky and go, oh, crikey, more QIPs, but they do make a difference, and I, I, and I, I commend you on, on the work you've done, and I think things like the confusion thing, that's really very, very welcome. My colleagues are nodding at the back of the room. It's incredibly welcome to have some sort of scoring system that says, do we need to do a CT brain on everybody who gets a bit confused in the chest ward because they get a bit hypoxic or they get a bit of sepsis? So thanks for that, and I really look forward to seeing the results and see if we can fine-tune it. And of course, the CTPA question. Um, uh, Tom and I, Tom Taylor and I have looked at CTPAs every five years for the last 15 years, I think. So I hope you crack that nut, because uh, we didn't really manage. Does anybody have any questions they'd like to Ask and Nikki's going to be here as well. So, if anybody questions about MDTs or audit or 
Anything at all. We were late starting, so I can understand if you want to sneak away. That's all fine. Okay, well, we'll call it a day at that then. Um, anything from Perth in the dark? No, they're sort of waving. They must be happy or asleep. Okay, so um, uh, I've completely forgotten what's next week. The right say the medical school are, are presenting next week. They're going to present. Uh, Katie Daniels is coming, so they're going to have a number of speakers talking about uh, work overseas, uh, the Tayside Institute of Global Health, what they get up to on their electives, and some other bits and pieces as well. So come along to see that next week. If you have an interesting topic you want to talk about, if you have your own audit or curatorial improvement, then let me know because we have slots all the way until July. And apart from that, I shall see you all next week. Thank you very much again to our radiologists.